Our world is full of peaceful scenes that calm our souls. It may be a stream in the autumn forest, the profound quiet of a dusk in the desert, or the calming waves on the shores of the ocean. These scenes are the norm in the great outdoors, but there are the exceptions which capture our full interest. They include earthquakes with resultant tsunamis, volcanic eruptions that are both mesmerizing and terrifying, or great landslides that remind us that our Earth can be very unstable. And there's the ultimate catastrophe that we contemplate. Asteroid impacts and the profound destruction they cause. We know of major catastrophes that are surely coming in the future, such as an eruption of the Great Yellowstone Volcano. Every unusual geyser eruption or earthquake in the region makes us nervous. Then there are the future catastrophic events that we are unaware of, or slightly aware of. Hello, I'm Myron Cook. Experiencing nature is calming and peaceful. The vast majority of us have never experienced a catastrophic geologic event, which gives us a sense that somehow the Earth is geologically stable, even though we know that there have been numberless catastrophic events in the past, and most certainly numberless ones in the future. In this video, we'll explore one of these future events that has incredible consequences for the eastern United States and parts of Canada. And we'll also uh, investigate whether this fascinating earthquake that occurred in 2024 in New Jersey, whether it is an early indicator of this event. Let's get started. Most of us are pretty familiar with the basic elements and processes of plate tectonics. We know that oceanic plates can plunge below continental crust in subduction zones, creating volcanoes above. We understand that this process forms the great ring of fire that surrounds the Pacific Ocean, as shown on this map of earthquakes. Furthermore, we know about spreading ridges where new oceanic crust is formed, like the great mid-Atlantic ridge that has created the Atlantic Ocean over the span of some 200 million years. These two main processes of plate tectonics result in the plates continually moving. Even with all the evidence and knowledge we have of these processes, it seems impossible that the stable ground we live our lives on is continually floating around on the globe. You know, even for me, I have a hard time getting my head around the concept that the plates, the continents, are moving around on the earth, banging into each other and diving under each other and all that business. And I find it helpful to scale things down to a size that I can kind of get my head around. And I've done this before. I've used this exercise ball here to represent the Earth and scale it down to this size. Now, the continental crust is about 25 miles thick or so. It varies. But it, with it scaled down to here, to this size, how thick would that continental crust be on this exercise ball? Have you got a thought? Well, it is... 11 pages of printing paper thick. That's how thick it is. Now, uh, think about the oceanic crust. Well, it's two pages thick. Wow. Now, with that in mind, I hope you start to get a feel of, of how fragile these plates are. And with all this energy, so imagine this ball being the Earth and all that heat within, you know, sometimes molten rock in here, and these tiny thin plates uh, on the surface, uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to imagine how they're moving around and, and quite uh, fragile, isn't it? With this perspective, the lava lake that often forms on the Kilauea volcano of Hawaii can be a small-scale example of many of the plate tectonic processes. A thin, cooling crust of lava can represent new oceanic crust. It's apparent this surface is quite unstable, with fractures continually forming, and areas of new crust formation are constantly changing. Also, pieces of the crust dive into the molten lava below. For good reason, we focus on the dramatic examples of plate tectonics, such as India slamming into Asia at high rates of speed to form the mighty Himalayas and Tibetan Plateau. We tend to ignore the quiet parts of plates referred to as passive margins. There just isn't much going on there. 
For the most part, both sides of the Atlantic Ocean are passive margins, where oceanic plates and continental plates are fused together and aren't active margins with their accompanied subduction zones, volcanoes, and earthquakes. I want to make sure we're on the same page, so I did a quick sketch here on the whiteboard. Uh, Cross-sectional view. Let's focus on the top first. I've put my handy little tree here to make sure we know we're looking sideways. And we see continental crust represented by these two black lines here and convection within the upper mantle that we're familiar with. And because of this convection, it creates tension on the continental crust and pulls it apart. And then we have phase two. I'll put right here where the two continental pieces have split. They've pulled apart because of this convection. And of course, all that molten rock is, is coming up at the center area here. The ridge, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, is, would be a modern example, creating this new ocean, oceanic plate, oceanic crust, and uh, represented in the green here. And it's kind of welded right onto the continent on both sides. And as I've mentioned, nothing going on, on here. It's passive uh, versus the active with the subduction zone. So I hope that sets the stage clearly for all of us. This map shows the tectonic plate boundaries outlined in red, and the orange colored areas are the passive margins. They're really quite common, aren't they? I've added another part to my whiteboard sketch here, and that is an active margin with a subduction zone. So the green uh, oceanic crust is plunging underneath the continental crust, and I've even added a strata volcano here. And so I've added that because I want to put everything together here on this whiteboard to make a very simple point. Now, sometimes simple points or observations lead to profound insight, and I think this is one of them. Let's look here at the passive margin. We have oceanic crust welded on to the continental crust. And down here, at the same position, it can be observed that that's right where subduction occurs, at the same position. What implications does that have? What could it mean, if anything? This sure gets interesting when you start to think about it. And of course, geologists had to think it through. A Canadian geologist in the late 1960s by the name of John Tuzo Wilson grappled with these very issues. Do you think a subduction zone situated up against a continent like we see here in this illustration could have once been a passive margin? And if you think it was, how could it possibly have converted from a passive to an active margin? Wilson recognized that ocean basins are created and destroyed in cycles, and with this knowledge it was recognized that passive margins convert to active margins. The geologic history of plate tectonics tells us that this has to occur, and the implications are astounding for the East Coast. It will convert to an active margin in the future with a subduction zone and associated volcanoes and earthquakes. It's hard to imagine how different that world will be. Can you imagine a volcano along the Passaic River of New Jersey? Wow! So how is it that a passive margin can convert to an active margin? It seems rather, well, it seems kind of strange, doesn't it? And, and to understand that, we need to think through passive margins a bit more. So I have me a bas basic sketch with continental crust he over here, the oceanic crust and the, and the ridge here where uh, new ocean floor is being created as we speak, at least on the mid-Atlantic ridge. And if you think about it, there's an age profile with the youngest uh, oceanic crust here, and it gets older over towards the continent. This map shows the age of the oceanic crust. Note the colored bar at the bottom of the map that shows what age in millions of years the colors represent. For instance, the very dark violet colors represent an age of about 270 million years. This is the oldest known oceanic crust and occurs in the eastern portion of the Mediterranean Sea. The next oldest crust is about 200 million years old, and it is represented in the blue colors along the east coast of the United States. Not only is there an age profile across the oceanic floor, there's a density profile as well. 
Now, the density of the ocean crust is about 3 grams per cc, whereas the continental crust is about 2.7 grams per cc. So there's about an 11% difference. But if you think about, there's more heat here, so it's less dense, the oceanic crust. And as you get closer to the continent, it becomes somewhat more dense. So the average, I said, is 3. It's a little bit higher over here. It might be 12% more dense than the continental crust. So less dense, hotter over here, colder, older, cooler crust over here, more dense. And it gets thicker. So let me add that uh, here. The, the oceanic crust gets thicker. It builds up at the base as it's cooling. And this process takes a very long time. Geologists have explored the idea that maybe this high-density, old, cold crust here of the ocean crust up against less dense uh, continental crust creates an unstable situation. And it breaks free and starts subducting underneath. Now, this seems like a really good idea. But as they've modeled it and explored this concept more, most geologists have decided that, well, it's not enough to do it just from the density contrast alone. It's certainly helpful, but we probably need more. We've got to think about this a bit deeper, don't we? So I've made another sketch on my whiteboard, and we're going to go back to about 450 million years ago, at least in the upper part of my sketch here. Back just before Africa, over here, collided with North America. So there's very little uh, oceanic plate. We've got a subduction going. The, the oceanic plate is being gobbled up, and it's going to collide and form Pangaea, the supercontinent Pangaea. And of course, it forms the Appalachian Mountains, or Appalachian Mountains, depending on where you live. And so this is the stage 450 million years ago. And about 50 million years later, interestingly, it breaks right in the same uh, place. It's called rifting. So it rifts right more or less where it collided to start pulling back away from each other, these two continents, and form the modern day uh, situation. So, and that's represented here where we have North America, and at least I've put in half the Atlantic Ocean with the spreading ridge, the Mid Atlantic Ridge down here uh, after this separation. So, that sets an interesting stage for us to think about. Interestingly, I think this slab could play a role, this 450 million year old slab that's coming down here. It could play a role. How could that possibly be? Well, let's think this through here. Uh, this is just before the collision of the continents to form Pangaea. We have the slab, the subducted slab here. And what happens at, after the collision? Well, it's still hanging around, most assuredly. It, it would take a long time to melt this subducting slab here. And then we have rifting occur, where new oceanic plate forms in the same place, essentially, uh, creating the Atlantic Ocean. What's going on with the slab then? Well, it all comes down to, uh, well, how long can it keep uh, hang around? Well, it turns out that there's evidence, plenty of evidence, that parts of this slab continue even today. So I'm going to sketch that in a bit of a ghost here. So here we have a ghost pieces of this slab going down. And of course, it continues to sink deep into the mantle, these pieces of the slab. Some of them, I'm sure, are very large. And they have yet to melt. That's pretty amazing. The, the evidence uh, indicates that or suggests that. Now, again, what does that have to do with this uh, passive margin here converting to an active margin? Well, I want to go back to the uh, subduction here. If you think about uh, something that's uh, diving down, if you had a bucket of material that's, that's say, like honey or something, uh, pretty thick, and you put something that kind of just sinks slowly down into it, it pulls around that object. It has a pulling force that creates, in this case, the upper mantle is kind of being, uh, dr it drags along with it, and it sets up almost like a con uh, convection cell like we have here. It's flowing down along with it. And that, of course, would be the case here, too. There's still some uh, force 
from this sinking down and you've got some pull, some flow within the mantle that's tugging right on this passive margin. And now you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Because it has enough force to break that passive margin free from here. Of course, the density differences help that we've talked about. It pulls it free and creates a new subduction zone, the early phases of it. So that is a very strong theory for how these passive margins convert over to the active margins. I want to make something really clear because I know some of you are already asking this question. Why didn't this break free earlier? After all, we have this pulling force all the time throughout history. Great question. And I mentioned it, uh, you know, using density, but I want to focus on that just a bit more. The older this plate gets, this uh, oceanic plate up against the continent. Remember, we have very old oceanic plate right here. It's more dense and it also gets thicker, so that's a, even more force. And at some point, this density contrast force combined with what's left of this together uh, break, uh, breaks this free. As one would expect, there would be a lot of earthquakes associated with the oceanic plate breaking away to start subducting. This brings us to the 4.8 magnitude New Jersey earthquake that occurred on April 5th of 2024. It was the strongest one in New Jersey since 1783. Could this earthquake or any of the others scattered down the coast that have happened over the last 50 years or so be the first signs of the conversion of the passive margin? It's kind of fun to think about, isn't it? But it's one of those questions that's impossible to know the answer to. Who knows? The model we've discussed for the conversion of passive margins to active ones seems quite viable, doesn't it? But there are often multiple working ideas, and it turns out that there's something going on some 1,700 miles to the south that it could explain the future of the East Coast even better. The Lesser Antilly Islands of the Caribbean turn out to be very interesting. These islands are a volcanic arc being formed along a subduction zone where the South American plate is being subducted under the Caribbean plate. There are 17 active volcanoes in this arc. Looking at the bigger picture, we see the subduction zone in relation to the passive margin of the eastern seaboard. Do you think it would be possible that the subduction zone propagates northward and connects up to the passive margin in the future? I like to think of the subduction zone as a giant tear in the Earth's surface, which creates a zone of weakness that could propagate to the north, or the south, or both directions for that matter. Some geologists who are experts in plate tectonics believe that this will occur. In the end, we don't know exactly how or when this will occur, but geologic history informs us that it will happen. And just maybe, the New Jersey earthquake is an early indicator. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you did enjoy it, would you consider subscribing? Thank you for watching.